Hey, we're Aaron and Jennifer Smith with Marriage After God. Helping you cultivate an extraordinary marriage. And today we're going to talk about why suffering is good for us. Welcome to the Marriage After God podcast, where we believe that marriage was meant for more than just happily ever after. I'm Jennifer, also known as Unveiled Wife. And I'm Aaron, also known as Husband Revolution. We have been married for over a decade. And so far, we have four young children. We have been doing marriage ministry online for over seven years through blogging and social media. With the desire to inspire couples to keep God at the center of their marriage, encouraging them to walk in faith every day. We believe the Christian marriage should be an extraordinary one, full of life, love, and power that can only be found by chasing after God. Together. Thank you for joining us in this journey as we chase boldly after God's will for our life together. This is Marriage After God. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Marriage After God podcast. Hi. <laughs> we, lo- we love you guys. I just want to say uh, the first episode of the season of this year, it got I think it got up to number 32 or 33 mm. on the charts. Wow. And in iTunes. So that's all because of our listeners. Thank you guys. Downloading all of these episodes. You guys rock. I just want to say thank you. Hopefully they liked it. You know, that it was a good, good episode to kick off the year with. Yeah. If you liked it, share about the episode, take a screenshot of it, post it on Instagram, Facebook, and tag us in it. We love seeing those. At Marriage After God. And we might even share about your post on our Instagram account. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Okay. So Aaron, why don't you just give a little update where you at? How's your week? What's going uh, on? I think we talked about it last time. I, I'm starting to get up earlier. For a while, I've been getting up around 5.30 and going to the gym. I've been doing that for a couple of years now. And recently, um, I told you, Jennifer, that I wanted to get up even earlier. Mm-hmm. To give I was my, shocked, actually. To give myself an hour in the morning to get in the Word. Because remarkably, if I, if I don't like... I don't purpose to do it. It just doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. So I, I've, I figured what's the, be- the best way to do that. Or your amount of time spent in it wasn't as, yeah. you know, much. And so I figured the best thing to do would be get up earlier. Okay. <laughs> so now easy. what does your morning routine look like? So I've been getting up at four. My alarm goes off at four and then I hit snooze a couple of times. <laughs> I think I get up. I've been getting up around 420, 430. Now, the first time you did it, I was... I was woken up because usually you sneak out of the house pretty I, like, quietly. I turned the light on. You and, turned like, every light on. <laughs> I didn't turn every light on. <laughs> it was so bright. And then I, I was up at what, what The problem was is I forgot to set all of my stuff out the night before and I was like, I couldn't find anything. You weren't prepared. <laughs> I wasn't prepared. You should always be prepared. If you want to have like a, a, a good, good morning routine. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to have a good morning routine and a good marriage, uh, prepare. Like put your stuff out. <laughs> you know, get everything ready that you're going to be grabbing so you don't have to like look for it and scavenge. And I'm just teasing. I'm not even mad about yeah. it. I went back to bed. But um, <laughs> I I mean, I'm only a few days into it and it's it hasn't been terrible because I go, I go to the gym an hour earlier and I'll say this, I really enjoyed going to Starbucks and sitting down. There was like no one there and uh, getting into the word that was awesome. Cool. Um, and also I started back up doing my inter- intermittent fasting. Mm. You did that for a while, like a year ago? Yeah. And I, I only stopped because I... I I was just trying to do something different, yeah. um, get more calories, but I, I'm going back to it cause I feel like I got too much calories. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. I really like intermittent fasting. And if you don't know what intermittent fasting is, go look it up. It's pretty cool. Why don't you just explain real quick, briefly what you Essentially do. you fast for 16 hours and then you have like an eight hour window of eating. Essentially you just miss breakfast. Yeah. I was going to say most of us fast throughout the night. But this yeah. is like more intentional. Don't have that, you know, before bedtime snack or anything. Yeah. I'll usually not breakfast. eat from seven o'clock until 11 or noon mm-hmm. the next day, Okay. which is not always easy. But, but you also fit in those calories at lunch and dinner. Yes. Because you also, yes. you I mean, you work out. They know you do CrossFit. You lift heavy weights. So you need that energy. Yeah, I need enough. But so, it also, it does help me... Um, maintain how much I'm eating. Mm. And it also makes me think about what I'm eating. Mm-hmm. So I eat better instead of just spreading all those calories out. Okay. Anyways, I've, I've gotten back into that and kind of liking it. Again. Awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Okay, you guys, we also want to encourage you to sign up right now for the Marriage Prayer Challenge if you have not done that yet. Uh, it's really awesome. Aaron, how many couples have already joined? Uh, almost 30,000 couples. What? There's actually a number counter on the sign-up page. That's so cool. And it's a real number counter. Okay. <laughs> I didn't make That's it up. That's awesome. It's not fake. It's actually counting people that sign up. Okay. So you just go to marriageprayerchallenge.com. You can sign up for the husband version or the wife version. 
And what do they get? They're going to get a email every day around the time that they signed up, okay. uh, giving them a prompt and a reminder to pray for their spouse. Awesome. Yeah. Come on, you guys, go sign up. It's awesome. Yeah. So it's marriageprayerchallenge.com, completely free. Just give us your email and your name and boom, you'll start getting those emails every, every day for 30 days. So today's topic is on why suffering is good for us. And we're not just talking about physical suffering or sickness or things like that, but we're going to get into, um, well, we're just going to get into something that you spoke on recently, Aaron, that really, really moved me because I love it when you can look at scripture and see it a different way. Mm. I need that help sometimes. Yeah. Someone else coming in and going, hey, look at this. This is awesome. So I just want to dig in. I want to get it. So this is kind of like a devotional style episode. Yeah, we, we've, we, Jennifer and I came up with this idea to do one devotional focused episode every month. And so this would be that one. And uh, the topic... Um, is something I actually talk, taught on this last Sunday. Mm -hmm. And you said, hey, we should do an episode on that teaching. So that's kind of what we're going to do. We'll talk about stuff I, I brought up from scripture, and then you might have some questions for me. But it's a it was, it's pretty cool, and it's, it's on a very small section of scripture. I'll say this. One reason that I love that you're my husband is that you teach me, and I love that. I love that you can look at scripture and teach me from it. And so I'm excited about this episode because I feel like you're going to have the opportunity to teach others the, the same with the same impact that you've had in my life just over this one scripture. I mean, well, thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. Keep it up, Aaron. Yeah. Well, and I, <laughs> I want to emphasize that, you know, I, my hope and prayer is that whenever, whenever I'm teaching the word of God, that it's not my opinion, not my, yeah my own, um, flavor of things, but <laughs> that I'm just trying to clearly teach what the word of God is saying. Yeah. So I hope that that's what I'm doing right now. Yeah, it's good. So uh, I'll just kick it off. The The section of scripture that we're going to be discussing is mainly from 1 Peter chapter 4, and it's only the first four verses, okay. which is going to be the the chunk of what we're talking about. It doesn't sound like a lot of scripture, but there's actually a lot in here. Well, we're also going to dig into Romans 8, and that has a little bit more. Yeah. So there's still a lot of reading, but... Yeah, well, there, there's a lot of scripture to help give context yeah. to these few lines of text. So are we going to start out with you... Reading First Peter? Uh, like yeah. give them just the context of what we're going to be talking about? So it's actually verses 1 through 3. I'm going to uh, read it right now, starting in verse 1. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that has passed suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Okay, so before we jump into these set of scriptures, can you just expand a little bit about when it comes to doctrine and universal doctrine? Yeah, so I, I started off this teaching actually on Sunday, just explaining how there when we when we come up with doctrine, which are like the fundamental things that a believer should walk in, teach. These are the things that are core, right? Doc doctrines in the Word of God. Uh, a doctrine, in order for it to be a doctrine, it's got to be universal. Yeah. Like you can't pull something from Scripture and say, this is doctrine, but it doesn't apply in Iran. It doesn't apply in Africa. It doesn't apply in the suburbs. Right. Or just certain groups of people. Or certain groups of people. Or certain churches. Right. So yeah. if if we interpret or pull things from Scripture that isn't universally applied when taught, then it's got to be interpreted through universal doctrine mm -hmm. so that, that you can't just pull that and say, well, that's doctrine. See mm -hmm. that, you know, and one example of this would be the prosperity gospel, this idea that God wants every single person to be wealthy and perfectly healthy, which isn't backed up with scripture at all. Because well, we also don't see it in real life. Uh, yeah. You don't, you don't see it played out. There's people all over the world that are not wealthy or healthy. Yeah. But they love the Lord. God mm -hmm. uses them. This is the this is reality on both sides. Um, we see scripture like um, in, in Ecclesiastes that God gives rain to the evil and the good, mm -hmm. right? Evil and the righteous. So there are certain things that um, he has a certain level of blessing on every person. He gives breath. He gives the sunlight. He gives rain. He gives food, sustenance, what, regardless of how they are. Mm -hmm. So the prosperity gospel in the, in the sense of God wants you to prosper financially and with possessions doesn't work universally. But what does work, and this is where I, I, I ended off, was uh, the universal doctrine of suffering, mm -hmm. right? Without suffering, there is no salvation. Christ learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Mm -hmm. He says that believers will suffer. 
which kicks us off for this first verse that you read, which I don't know if you want to read it again. Yeah, but... it says, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, right? It doesn't say he suffered in the spirit, he suffered in the flesh. Mm-hmm. It says, arm yourselves with this same way of thinking. Not so, just some of you, not just yeah. you over there in the corner. Yeah, it tells, it tells every believer to arm themselves with this way of thinking of understanding the suffering of Christ. And the suffering of the flesh. And the suffering of the flesh, which we're going to get into. So I, when I say doctrine, this idea that suffering is a doctrinal teaching, we cannot subtract it from scripture. We cannot subtract it from the Christian life. We cannot say, oh, that was, yeah, that's good, but only for Christ. And then he doesn't want his children to suffer. He says, if I suffered, you will also suffer. They hated me. They're going to hate you. Mm-hmm. These are all things that the Bible teaches. And no matter where you go in the world, it doesn't matter where you live, we should, it should be something that is taught and understood mm-hmm. by the believer. This idea, this doctrine of suffering, but there's many types of suffering. Right. And that what we're going to, what we want to talk about right now is what this is talking about. What am I arming myself when realizing Christ suffered? Mm -hmm. What's the, what's the weapon that I'm using? And what it is, is an understanding of what suffering is for the believer and why it's so good for us and the varying aspects, you know, because the first thing we think of probably is you know, suffering massive pain or loss, right? Yeah. Which is definitely a, a form of suffering. But really what suffering is at the base level is our flesh. Dying to ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Dying. Mm-hmm. That's what suffering is. You know, when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, the cross is the instrument of death of your flesh, your body. You put a body on it and it, it dies there. Yeah. And so suffering in, in um, the sense that we're going to talk about is not just this like overtly physical suffering. It's telling our flesh now. Right. That's suffering. So, and you, and as we go through this scripture, we'll see that more and more. Um, but that's what we want to kind of get the believer that everyone listening to understand is like, we shouldn't be running from suffering. We shouldn't fear the idea that our flesh is going to endure some sort of discomfort and mm-hmm. pain and that we're not going to always get what we want and we're Mm going to have to tell ourselves no. And these are all forms of Mm -hmm. telling our flesh, no, it's suffering. Mm -hmm. It's because you don't like the, the body suffers when it doesn't get what it wants. Right. That's suffering. When you feel pain, it's something that the body doesn't want, which is why you get that pain signal saying, Hey, this is not good. Stop it. Right. (laughs) So I, I, I really hope, we really hope that this episode is encouraging to you guys and gives you a fresh perspective of how suffering is good to us, Mm -hmm. good for us, um, especially in context to um, our sin nature and the suffering of our flesh. Which Um, is the, which is the exact purpose of this. Yeah. Like of putting away that sin nature, having the spirit of God win and not the flesh. Right. Uh, Do you want to jump into Romans eight? Yeah. Cause Romans eight gives us, a perfect context for the second part of the scripture that says, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, right? So we, we, we realize that Christ's suffering in the flesh, we can have the same way of thinking of recognizing the suffering of our flesh mm-hmm. is a weapon against something. And it says, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And this can be taken very literally, which it, it should be, I think, because if we have perfectly suffered the way Christ has, we would have perfectly ceased from sin because Mm -hmm. once we're dead and gone and with God, (laughs) there's no more sin in in us, but we're in the flesh. So it says, whoever suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And and I think Romans eight perfectly clarifies what this is saying. And it says this in Romans eight verse one, there is therefore no, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. First and foremost, like believer, believe this. (laughs) It's true. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So what has set you free from the law of sin and death? It's Christ Mm -hmm. and his spirit, right? It says, for God has done what the law weakened by our flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So whoever you should reiterate that last part. Well, whoever has, what he's saying is the law, which is good and perfect and righteous, couldn't save any man because man has weak flesh. Yeah. In our flesh, we cannot fulfill the law. But Christ did fulfill the law and and in his own flesh, Mm -hmm. right? And so what it's saying is that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us through the putting away of our 
flesh through Christ. <laughs> right. I just love that that last part that you just read. It says, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, which is foundational to what we're going to be teaching from First so, Peter. And it's a choice. They're yeah. all choices, right? These are choices that the believer have because we've been set free. Mm -hmm. So we have the freedom to now choose righteousness rather than only being obedient to sin. Right. And it's through our actions that we walk according to not to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Right. So this says walk not according to the flesh. So if you take anyone who has suffered in the flesh and say anyone who walks not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit mm -hmm. ceases from sin. That's, mm -hmm. that's kind of what this is saying for those, this is verse five, for those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, set their minds on the things of the spirit. Okay. I got to stop you again, because I feel like there's often I'm sure everybody can relate to this, but when you struggle with sin and you you, you wrestle with the, those temptations that come, your mind is on it, right? Like you, like when your mm -hmm. mind is set on something that your flesh desires and wants to do, right? It doesn't go away till either you do it or, or you, tell, you it no, tell it no, which is suffering, right? This is and this is where we're trying to define this. But that whole set of your mind, it starts there, mm -hmm. right? And then it says this: for to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Raise your hand if you want life and yeah. peace. <laughs> For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. I don't want that. Hostile. Like you are an enemy of God when your mind is on the flesh. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So when the Bible tells us that the flesh and the spirit are opposed to each other, or against each other. Yeah. That's what, the, what this is saying. Saying you, when you're walking in the flesh, you you not you can't please God. You're an enemy. When you walk in the spirit, you please God. And it's God's spirit that mm -hmm. we walk in. And then it says this, you believer, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. So remember what we said, whoever has suffered in the flesh mm -hmm. has ceased from sin. Let's put it this way. Uh, although the body is dead, suffered in the flesh because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Mm -hmm. So the spirit that God's put in us is brought to life our mortal bodies. And listen to this, verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Mm -hmm. So I thought this scripture perfectly um, illustrated what it says right here when it says, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Mm -hmm. So when we're going to get more and more right now into this idea of suffering in the flesh, it's this idea of walking in the spirit and not the flesh as Romans also says. Mm -hmm. When you gratify the desires of the flesh, you cannot please God, mm -hmm. right? But if you walk in the spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, and so this is what this is getting to. Um, Peter's talking here and he's explaining how Christ's suffering in the flesh has done this for us, mm -hmm. has given us a way to suffer in our flesh not in a, a way of self salvation because we can't Christ already did it. Mm -hmm. His suffering was sufficient, but because of his suffering and it, from his own words, because he left and went home to be the, with the father, he sent his helper, the mm -hmm. spirit mm -hmm. to work in us and through us his to, for his will and his work in us. So what we can do now is we can learn to suffer in our flesh via the Holy spirit, mm -hmm. meaning, I don't gratify the desires of my flesh. Mm -hmm. So when you want a donut, I love donuts. I love donuts. Right. Or you want that new car or you want your neighbor's thing coveting, right? Mm -hmm. Or you want to avoid shame. So you lie. These are all fruit of the flesh. These are things yeah. to protect your flesh. I don't like the way that feels. I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to look shameful. Mm -hmm. I, I have pride. I don't want them to think this way about me. It's all, it's all the flesh. Mm -hmm. So suffering is like, here's a form of suffering in the flesh, humbleness. Mm -hmm. That's painful. Humbling yourself, getting down on your knees and saying, I 
am this thing. I did this thing. I said this and I want to, I want to be forgiven Mm -hmm. by you. Like humbling yourself, recognizing you're not that great of a person Mm -hmm. is suffering is telling your flesh. No, I'd rather you suffer and my spirit be lifted up. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So you started out that, um, little lineup of, of things that people struggle with, with a donut. So can you just explain like, cause eating a donut doesn't have to do with humility. What does it have to deal with? Well, again, our flesh, if you, uh, and I explained this on Sunday, I was talking about how our brains work. Our brain, is, our, our brain matter, it's flesh. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a compilation of cells and there's these chemicals that get released and you have sensors and receptors and you have all these things that God gave us mm-hmm. to work a certain way, you know, pleasure sensors and pain sensors and all these things and those are all the flesh. Now, what the point is, is they don't just shut them all off. It's to put them into submission to the spirit. Right. Right. So a donut, right? Having a donut is not sinful. Yeah. Like, oh, a donut's good. But not having any control and letting your senses control you mm-hmm. is not walking in the spirit. Mm. It's walking in the flesh. So if um, like that a seafood diet, I see food and I eat it. <laughs> yeah. What that that's that's not having any control. Right. The spirit's not in charge. Your conscience isn't in charge. It's oh, I see it. I'm going to put it in my mouth and I'm mm-hmm. going to eat it. Mm-hmm. Um, think about so it. So the with, donut can represent a lot of different things. Yeah. 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 Think about um, pornography. Yeah. Like you have no. You're not controlling your flesh. You're saying flesh. You can have whatever you want. Mm-hmm. That's not suffering. <laughs> that's not, no. That, that well, we suffer in the spirit. And we suffer the consequences. <laughs> yeah, we suffer the consequences, but you're not causing your flesh to suffer. T- right. Telling your flesh. No, I don't want you to have that. I know yeah. you want that. I know you crave it. I know you think that's going to be good for you, but the spirit of God that's in me says mm-hmm. no. That's good. Okay, so I want to move on because there's a lot of clarity that comes from this next verse and how you broke it down, which is what impacted yeah. me probably the most uh, out of this teaching. And so we're going to, I'm going to reread the the verse. It's verse three. It says, for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. And I remember you stopped and said, underline like, that. Yeah, yeah. underline what want to wants do. to do. Because our flesh wants to do a lot of things. You just gave those examples. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatries. Now, okay, I just have You've to explain. you read this a lot, right? Yeah, I've yeah, read this a lot. Up. But I need to explain, because I'm sure people would re- relate to me on this. When you read certain scriptures, it's not that you don't say, and I know I'm not perfect. I know that there's sin in my life, mm-hmm. and I'm willing... F- to have open eyes and for God mm. to reveal that to me. But when I read this, I go, well, I'm not it's really not struggling with those things. I don't really yeah. have drinking parties or whatever, but you broke it down in a way that makes this verse relatable to all sinners. Mm-hmm. And so I want to share that. Well, and let's, let's remember what we're, what the context of this is this Christ suffering, being armed with this way of thinking, mm-hmm. recognizing like that our, our flesh, we having our flesh suffer while walking in the spirit uh-huh. is how he sees from sin is, is how we walk the way God wants us to. Mm-hmm. And so he gives the contrast. He says, for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. And now when it says Gentiles, it's meaning godless people. Gentiles were anyone that wasn't a Jewish person. Okay. And so he's, what he's pointing out is not specifically Gentiles. He's saying anyone who doesn't, well, it doesn't have God, mm-hmm. isn't walking with God and want to do saying like, this is the way they want to be. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then it says living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness. And what I did is I broke down what these things are. And how right? they're all related. Because they're specific. Which, yeah, they're very specific. And I didn't realize that they were even related. I thought it was just one of those lists. You mm-hmm. know? So I want to, again, if you're listening and you have your Bible, the want to do part. Okay. It's want to live in sensuality and passions and drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Right. And like you said, well, see, I don't struggle with those things. Yeah. Oh, so I... You know, and maybe someone like me that struggled with pornography might p- point out sensuality and p- passions like, okay, like, yeah, but I've never done, I've never been a part of orgies. Like yeah. that's not me. Um, but I want to highlight that through Christ and his, his suffering and him giving us of his Holy spirit, we've been freed from the want to do mm-hmm. right. Yeah. He's changing our desires to be his. He's giving us a hatred of sin because mm-hmm. he hates sin. And I think in conjunction, uh, the convictions the convictions become stronger, and so we Absolutely. hear the Holy Spirit loud and clear when we go to do something that we mm-hmm. shouldn't be doing. Right? 
Yeah, our our prayer and constant desire should be that He's consistently giving us new desires and new cravings. Yeah, like Lord, get, I I pray, Lord, give me a craving for Your Word. Yeah, like I want I I don't I don't naturally in my flesh have enough craving for God's Word, mm-hmm. let alone a reading. <laughs> Sorry if you re- relate to that. Reading is uh, not something I just crave to do, but there's some people that love reading. Yeah, um, but I, I want God to change those desires. So the want to do is an amazing thing that God's freed us from. That yeah. we're no longer slaves to sin. That's the want to do. We're not slaves to our flesh. We're not slaves to our flesh. God severed that that slavery with his spirit. Mm-hmm. And now we can actually walk in that spirit when we focus on that spirit and we walk with his in his ways, in his word. That's how this works. So mm-hmm. I'm going to define some of these things. Sensuality. It's not just sexual. Uh, the, our, our definition of sensuality is is usually very sexual. And, it, and this absolutely does mean sexual, sensuality. Mm-hmm. But it's not only... S- Sexual. Sexual is one sense. It's one sense being usually this physical pleasure, right? That's what comes to my mind when I think about it. But sensuality in the biblical use is unbridled lust. Unbridled lust. Right? This idea of lust. I see something, I take it. Mm -hmm. I want to think about your five senses. Sensual. It's a sensual, it's a sensation experience. You're Mm -hmm. looking for your five senses to be pleasured. I want my eyes to see the most beautiful things. Or whatever I want them to see. Or whatever I want them to see. I want my hands to touch whatever is going to make my mind I want my feel ma- good. I want my mouth to say whatever I feel or like Or taste, saying. right? So you think about your five senses, and sensuality is living to please your five senses with whatever pleases your five senses. Mm. That's what sensuality is. Often, sexual things encompass all of them, mm-hmm. right? Which is why it's usually accom- accompanied with sensuality as a sexual thing, because <laughs> sexual things please pretty much all your yeah. senses. Um, but food, uh, music, all of these things, not that those things in themselves are sinful. I want everyone to clearly hear me. It's living in a way that you want your senses pleased. Mm-hmm. I want my senses, because that's the opposite of suffering, Okay. That's the opposite of severing. It's living for pleasure in every sense. You want your five senses taken care of. Mm-hmm. And if any one of them are hindered or hurt or suffer, you, you're not happy. And something's wrong and God must be angry or and, I'm not close to and God. And you can see this in the flesh um, when you feel the conviction of either someone saying something to you about something that you're doing or, or the Lord, the, the Holy Spirit just does it and you feel defensive. You immediately want to justify yeah. that thing that it's not that bad or that it's this or that it's that. And you become, mm-hmm. you, you want to fight for it. Yeah. There's got to be a way that I can still have this in my life. Yeah. Yeah. So an example of this is you, you're doing something like, and you're not recognizing it. And a brother or sister in Christ comes up and says, Hey, I noticed that you're, you're talking a certain way, or you did this certain thing. And you're like, don't judge me, get out of my way. And you're like, you immediately feel like you've been judged or wronged or hurt in reality. They were, you're, you're just getting checked in your spirit and your flesh doesn't like it. I also want to be realistic. Most people don't say, don't judge me. What they'll do is say, oh, okay. And then never talk to that person again. <laughs> yeah. Or they don't even communicate. Or say, well, let's just agree to disagree yeah. instead of, instead of allow, again, suffering in the flesh, humbling yourself and saying, maybe there is something I need to grow in. Yeah. Or man, that recognition alone just hurt. Yeah. And I'm going to walk in that for a little bit and, and see where God wants to take it. So I want to read this. I read this from Wikipedia. It's the definition of hedonism, which by the way, is this idea of pleasure centered living. Like I'm looking to please all my senses, hedonism. And it's a school of thought. This is what um, Wikipedia says. Hedonism is a school of thought that argues pleasure and suffering are the only components of well-being. Ethical hedonism is the view that combines hedonism with welfareist ethics, which claim that what we should do depends exclusively on what affects the well-being individuals have. Ethical hedonists would defend either increasing pleasure or reducing suffering for all beings capable of experiencing them or just reducing suffering. So think about that. Mm -hmm. It's as long as I'm not suffering, I'm happy or I want to be pleasured. And if I can't have pleasure, I just don't want to suffer. Mm. Now, I want everyone listening to think about that because we have areas in our life. Jennifer and I, we we were talking about this, that we think this way. Like, oh, I'm, I'm good with all this as long as, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't have to go without food. 
or that for a day. Or... or as long as I'm not going to fill this pain over here yeah. or this, I'm not going to have to say no to my flesh in this area. Mm-hmm. Right. We all have this level of pleasure centered focus mm-hmm. or at least um, avoidance of suffering. That's what this idea of hedonism is. is. So basically if, if we're, if we're living to pleasure our five senses, we can't possibly be pleasing or pleasuring God. Exactly. Because, because he might ask us to do something that doesn't feel good. That doesn't feel good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, And so a good, just a litmus test for us is to ask ourselves in those situations when we feel like we're just, it, it doesn't feel good. Something's going on. We're having this like emotional, which I'm about to talk about. Um, we can ask ourselves, am I trying to avoid letting my flesh suffer a little bit? Yeah. Am I trying to avoid saying no to my flesh? Mm. Okay. So the next one is passions. Mm-hmm. And when I think of the word passions, I immediately think of, uh, you know, things that I'm either passionate about or people who've said, right. I'm just a it's really passionate person. Yeah. I'm just a passionate person, mm-hmm. you know, but it, yeah, it's usually a positive thing, or maybe it has to do with extracurricular activities or something like that. Um, but mm-hmm. why don't you share... Yeah. The, um, so passions, the, the definition of passions in the dictionary is essentially uncontrollable emotional outbursts, mm. right? It's this like passionate outburst of anger, which the Bible says wrath is not good. The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And wrath is an uncontrolled um, emotional outburst um, or uncontrollable sadness or uncontrollable um, joy, mm-hmm. right? Or, like, or, or happiness. Like I'm just trying to, you know, get whatever these emotions are out. And what it, this idea is, is someone who lives purely off their emotions. Like, oh, I'm not happy, so things are wrong. Mm. But you know what? There's, you know how many stories there are in the Bible of people that, like a lot of David's Psalms mm. are him not happy. <laughs> now, they're still and joyfully because he knows who his Lord is and his Redeemer. Mm-hmm. But he's like in the muck and the mire. He's in a cave, you know, cold and scared. And like, so you would, the emotional, passionate person who lives by their emotions would say like, well, then David was doing something wrong because he wasn't happy, but that's not true. David was right where God had him Mm -hmm. and he was doing what he could do in in God's will. Mm -hmm. And so to be a person who's now, I'm not saying emotions are bad. God's given us all of these things. Yeah. Our senses are good things. Yeah. Our passions, our emotions are good things, but these are fleshly things. Meaning if they're the things that drive us, and dictate us, then the spirit of God is not. Yeah. I was just going to say, if, if, uh, someone's motivated to maintain a certain emotion or, um, are drawn out of their emotions Mm. to act, they can't serve their emotions and serve God. Mm -mm. Uh, A good example in scripture says, be angry and do not sin. Mm -hmm. So there, that's a perfect example of having and experiencing an emotion, but not letting it control you, letting it control you, not acting out of it. Yeah, you know how hard it is to to love someone who um, is harming you or doing you wrong, but that's what Scripture calls us to do. Because Christ did it. <laughs> because Christ did it. So there's there's things that our emotions will want us to do: wrath, outbursts, laughter, like lots of things. But God wants the spirit to be in control, mm-hmm. not our emotions, mm-hmm. right? And and I want to add to this. Often, so based on the sensuality things, when our five senses aren't being met with what they want, that's when our emotions react. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I'm not, I'm hungry. And so, you know, the whole term I'm hangry. Mm-hmm. Like, so you're having a sense a five, one of your five senses not being taken care of. So your emotions heighten. And so you let your emotions go to get what you want. Yeah. Right. That is not being in self-control. Mm-hmm. That is not walking by the spirit. That's walking in the flesh. And so th- this, I broke these down all like this to show us that these, this way of being is not the way the believer should be. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean we're not going to fall into like our emotions at times. And we're not, we're not to be these emotionless robots. What happens is, is God's given us a way to walk in the spirit, even amidst the heaviest emotional times, mm-hmm. Bro- like sadness and brokenness and fear and, and we can walk in the spirit in those yeah, things. Yeah, how do you submit those to God and walk righteously amidst feeling those right. really deep things? Like, so it all goes back to the, I mean, this is a universal doctrine that it doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter what you're going through. God has given you the freedom and through the spirit of God to rise above those things. Mm-hmm. 
and to appropriate those emotions where they belong. To go, if you're in your sadness, to go to God and weep before Him. And He says, I t- I've, I, I've bottled up every tear, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? So knowing that we can actually run to the fire, I'm so angry right now, God. Like, take my anger from me. Mm-hmm. Show me how to, to, to not be angry with my wife or my husband. My kids. Right, right. Or we can just handle it ourselves. And let's just take that emotion and let's just... Run with it. Run with it. And what usually happens, and everyone's thinking about those things when mm-hmm. they've let their emotions run, we regret it mm-hmm. every time. Mm-hmm. And we look back and we say, wow, that wasn't godly. That was not what Christ would have done. Or, man, I just wish I was different. Yeah. <laughs> when we can be, it's right. just the choices we're making. So I okay. want to go on to the next part, which... Um, Feels like an obvious one. Right. Drunkenness. Yeah. Don't drunkenness. Be drunk. Well, yeah. it's not just intoxication though. Well, it, you're right. Um, it is. When it, you look up the definition, drunkenness is, it's being right. intoxicated by something like alcohol. Right. And this is clearly talking about like no believer should, should get drunk. Yeah. This is just. The Bible talks too much about being sober minded. Yeah. And, and, and not being drunk specifically. Yeah. So, so I do want to clarify, I'm not saying this doesn't mean you can go get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> like the like, no believer should be getting drunk. Ever. Well, and all of these things mean what they are. Yeah, it just they also have a, deeper a, spiritual a, meanings. A deeper spiritual meanings that we can apply to address our sin. Well, nature. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about what drunkenness is. Okay. Yes, it's being drunk on alcohol. Yeah. Right. Or some sort of drug. Okay. Like you're, you're not your mind is, um, it's overtaken by something else, which mm-hmm. is essentially what drunkenness is. You're allowing a substance, an external force to take over your flesh. Mm -hmm. That's what drunkenness is. You drink enough alcohol. What happens? You start, the Bible talks about it. You start saying things you would never say out loud. You start acting a way you'd never act before. I always saw that or associated it with the word uncontrolled. Like that person's Mm -hmm. uncontrolled right now, but I never considered the aspect of it being, you're actually being controlled by that thing Mm -hmm. that you just ingested. Yeah. And I'll give an example. Proverbs 20 verse one says, wine is a mocker. So it's saying that the alcohol has an influence to mo- to Crazy. cause you to mock. That's really true. Strong drink, a brawler, mm-hmm. wants you to fight. fight. And, and ca- all of these things are like very fleshly things. And whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Mm. So now, nowhere in scripture does it say you're not allowed to drink. Now, some people will take it that way. And I'm just, we're talking about alcohol, so I'm just bringing it up. But 100%, absolutely, no believer should be getting drunk yeah. on anything. Um, but the next thing I'm going to talk about. And it says, wine is a mocker, strong drink and brawler, and whoever is led astray. So I've given myself over to this substance, this thing, Mm -hmm. to now do what it wants with me. Like, not as if it's a real person, but like, we have these these basic, uh, all of these things that are talking about the flesh. We have these basic ways of being in the deep parts of us. the way he designed it. Like, he designed us to- But he wants it under control. Yeah. Not- let go of. And so the, the other uh, um, part I want to say is in Ephesians 5.18, it says, do not get drunk with wine. Again, there's a direct command. Don't get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the spirit. So it's saying, okay. don't let your flesh yeah. go by letting it be overtaken with wine, alcohol, other substances, but be filled with the spirit of God. This also shows that deeper spiritual meaning of what we're trying to show here. Mm-hmm. When you talk about drunkenness, because drunken by the spirit, that sounds weird. But like it's because it of that deeper. <laughs> but it's because of that deeper meaning that right. we're talking about. And at the base level of what um, drunkenness is, it's literally the removal of the natural functions that God's put in us, that inhibition in us, mm-hmm. that conscience, that ability and restraint that is naturally in us to like. There's a, maybe there's something I want to say, but I'm not going to say because that's not appropriate. Mm-hmm. You're drunk, and it just comes out of your mouth. Mm-hmm. So you're, what you're doing is you're, you're living in the sensuality way. You want all your senses met. You're living through with your emotions and then you get, you want to be drunk and you want you to release the natural built in barriers that God's given you to protect you from doing or saying Purple something. Things. Yeah. Things that don't honor you, don't honor others, don't honor God. And so again, it's, it's like this. I want to just let it all out. Mm-hmm. I don't want any control. It's the exact opposite of self-control. Mm-hmm. It's no control, which then leads us into the awkward one, orgies, <laughs> right? Which everybody's thinking sexual experience. Which again, it, it means that. It is, but it also means more than that. Right. It, if you look at orgies at the base idea of what an orgy is, it's overindulgence. So all the things we just talked about, it's doing all of it without 
restraint. <laughs> yeah. No barriers, no limitations. Like, oh, that as was long a, as that you was want, a good as much donut. as you want. Yeah. Oh, and that was another good donut. That was a good box of donuts. That Those two boxes of donuts were amazing. Yeah. Right. But of course, I, I would feel gross after that. But, but like, or alcohol, like alcoholics, like they, they don't restrain themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're talking about these, these things that go in the mouth, but think about anything, anything in your life that you don't want any restraint on. So it's overindulgence and it's giving into your flesh and you're never sat- satisfied. You're never mm-hmm. satiated. Yeah. When you're in the flesh, it's never enough. The flesh never has enough. You know who says this? Uh, Solomon says it in Ecclesiastes 1.8. It says, all things are full of weariness. A man can, cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. Okay, so just that made me think of the porn industry. And oh, yeah. they get hooked at an early age, but then it's not enough to gratify mm-hmm. what their eye is seeing. So mm-hmm. it gets worse and worse, deeper and deeper into these things and, that yep. are just wicked. And, and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And still yet never satisfied. And this is like the exact opposite of what Christ wants for us. He, he says the time is in that just in that verse, it says the time has passed that suffices. Meaning it's like we've done enough of this. Literally, he's saying that we have freedom from this unsatisfied, never ending cycle. Well, what does Christ, what did Christ say to the woman at the well? He, oh, he, so, yeah. So the woman comes to him and he's, and she asks for water and he says, if you would ask me, I would have given you water that you would never thirst again. Yeah. And she says, where's this water? Give it to me. So it's this <laughs> contrast know? of, um, allow your flesh to rule you and, and never, never be, enough, yeah. and never be satisfied or walk in the spirit and be who you are in Christ with freedom and be completely satisfied. Right. Well, in Christ, God wants us to be satisfied in him alone. Yeah. Right. And so when we walk in the flesh, like this idea of orgies, it's like, I just want to go somewhere that's going to give me everything I want and as much of it as I can. Mm -hmm. And this is not the way of the believer. We are satisfied, completely satisfied in Christ. Right. And so I just wanted to, this was a um, historical note. I I saw when looking up this idea of orgies, which I did very carefully, by the way. Um, yeah. I didn't even think about that. Uh, yeah. And it, historically, the word comes from, it's a Greek word, um, or, orgia or something like that. Um, but what it was, was it was a, it was a ritual, a secret rites used to worship a Roman God. And the Roman God was the God of grapes and vines and caused men to be crazy. Wow. So it's this idea of when we have this way of being, we're like, I just want to go and I want to throw all my inhibition out and I want to drink and I want to eat and I want to have fun. And I want my five senses pleased and I want to just be happy. And you're literally worshiping something other than God. Mm-hmm. That's this idea. When you, when you walk in the flesh in this way. Um, so why don't we, we're going to go to the next one. There's two more. We're almost done. Drinking parties. Um, and this idea of drinking parties is exactly what it says. These parties that you're just going to get drunk. Again, in reading right. the list in scripture, I skip over because I go, well, I'm not doing that. Yeah. But but, the, I, but <laughs> the, the deeper idea is parties, meaning multiple, meaning many others, meaning you're inviting others to partake in all of this way of being. Yeah. Right. That, that's the way that the people that don't know God, you know, the Bible says, you know, don't associate with a, uh, with the wicked for they can't even sleep until they've caused bloodshed or until they've caught people in their snare. Like these ideas of, of drawing others into the same way of living. And it can be fleshly. A, it could be as simple as you're sitting in a room full of friends and you start gossiping the, the invitations can be subtle, but I think that the reason people do it is because they don't want to do it alone. Mm-hmm. They don't want to be alone in their sin. They're seeking approval. So if, if I can get so-and-so to do it along with me, then there's this sense of approval that it's okay. Yeah. Um, or maybe, maybe wrestling with the shame and guilt that comes with mm-hmm. sin that you want to forget about. And so you have others join in. Yep. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why. Well, I, I'll give a, a great example in my own life and it's something I'm not proud of, but when I was deep into pornography and I would meet new men, like in churches that I, there were pastors or they were like older or wiser and, and deep down inside, either I thought there's no way that he's not addicted to pornography, just like me, or I hoped that he was mm. because I didn't want to be the only one. And I thought, no, every single one of these guys does too. It's so broken. It's so broken. So in my mind, this drinking parties idea, this idea of like, like, oh, we're in this together. Yeah. I think we should all be. He's a sinner like me and he's going to, he does the same things as I do. And I actually hoped he did. 
I think this is a good time to just um, caution us to evaluate ourselves. Are we inviting others to partake in sin that maybe we're not recognizing as sin or we've mm-hmm. pushed away that conviction from the Holy Spirit? And let's ask God this week, what areas of my life have I been inviting people to partake in with me mm-hmm. that aren't righteous? Yeah, well, it first takes that self-evaluation of like, God, is there anything in me yeah. that you want out of me? Yeah. Um, a, a good example in the marriage. Do you remember when we were going through financial stuff? Um, I would let you spend the way we probably shouldn't spend, knowing that it would let me spend the way I wanted to spend. Right. Because then when you would request something, mm-hmm. I would I would have to say yes, especially because knowing. I'd be like, Well, I let you get your thing. Yeah. And essentially, we were just pulling each other down. That's really good. So in marriage, we that's often where the invitation starts. Keyword: drinking party. <laughs> Oh, don't invite me. I'm just kidding. Don't invite me. Um, last thing, lawless idolatry. Everything we just walked through is lawless idolatry. And here's why it's self worship. Yeah. How, how I feel, what I want mm-hmm. is God. Well, it should be God. No, what I'm oh, saying oh, yeah, is, is yeah. what I'm, you feel and what you want is God. Right. Is your God. Right. Is, what I feel, is your God. Yeah. But what we should be saying is God, what do you want? Yeah. God, do you want me to be hungry right now? Yeah. And I, I keep talking about these physical things because this is the idea is well, that's where it starts. We are to be spiritual people. God said, um, J- Jesus told the woman at the well, the same, that same story. He, she's talking about where they worship because she was a Samaritan. He was a Jew. Um, and she says, he says, well, there's going to be a day that you will neither worship there or here, but my people will worship me in spirit and in truth. Yeah not worshiping in passions and sensuality and as Jude says, and that happens in, even in the church, I'm going to worship God with my senses. Mm -hmm. And if I don't sense God and feel God and and my, my senses aren't being met and pleasured by the spirit of God, then I must be far from God. Mm -hmm. But you know what? There's many people in the Bible that, that were in the pit. Like I think of Paul and he's singing worship songs, naked and cold and in prison. Mm -hmm. In that moment, most people will be like, I don't feel close to God. I feel, I don't, he's not helping me. This doesn't feel good. But Paul knew exactly who his Savior was. Mm-hmm. And he knew that what he was dealing with, as he says in Scripture, he says, for I, I, I have ascertained that my current suffering is nothing to be compared with my, the coming glory. Mm-hmm. What that means is this temporary suffering, this, the, the little bit of saying no in my flesh, the little bit of pain that I feel, the little bit of, of depravity or depraving of my own desires for the the, the sake of God's will and God's th- thing that he wants done in my life and in others is so much or so little to be compared with the glory that I'm going to experience mm-hmm. when he returns. Which is, is a, it's a hopeful message for us as Christians. Oh, yeah. Like we should hear that and be like, yes, like we're in agreement here. We should be willing to suffer. And this is why suffering in the flesh is good for us. Yeah. And, and a lot of people don't like talking about suffering. But this, again, is a universal doctrine that Christians should b- understand and walk in that my flesh does not get to win in my life. And when we feel those those convictions from the Holy Spirit going, you know, day to day, whatever it might be, when you don't tell yourself no, you're putting yourself in a place of worship that you should not be in. Mm-hmm. You're 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 idolizing yourself. You're saying, God, I'm more more important than you. My comfort's more important than your will. Yeah. My my pleasure's more important than than your word. And that and so each one of these is like this progress of worshiping self versus creator. Yeah. worshiping the creation rather than the creator. My comfort, my pleasures, my senses are much more important mm-hmm. than what God's doing in my life. It's a dangerous place to be. Yeah. And a good example, a good example of this is the reason why many people have our time getting out of debt or quitting certain addictions or making life changes is because that's too difficult for my flesh to handle. Even though God's like, but I'm going to give you the strength to do it. Yeah. I think too, just to shed a little bit more perspective on this, idea of suffering. I think sometimes we only go so far to see what we would suffer in the midst of saying no to our flesh. Mm -hmm. So like, it's that little bit of, I tried. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, we we see what suffering equals when we say no to our flesh, but we don't look beyond that to see what suffering looks like when we don't say no to our flesh, the consequences, the hurt, the pain, the death, the sin that comes because of the choices that we make. And that's what all of, all of this of what we're talking about today is comes down to choice. Mm-hmm. You're going to choose to walk in the spirit or you're going to choose to gratify the, the desires of the flesh. And you know, believer, you're listening to this. You've been set free. Yeah. You're, you're not a slave to sin and death. We, we can choose to walk in the spirit that God's given us. It, he dwells in us, mm-hmm. giving life to our mortal bodies. 
How amazing is that? Mm-hmm. So this isn't a go suffer and and find your righteousness through just self um, depravity and self, you know, self abasement. That's not what we're talking about. There are some faiths and some religions that believe that if you just make yourself suffer enough, you'll be righteous. Now the point is, is we're already righteous, and the way a righteous person walks with the Spirit of God is it doesn't we don't gratify the desires of our flesh, and when we do. We recognize it, we repent, and we say, thank you, Lord, for forgiving me mm-hmm. and give me your power to walk better next time, to to beat that thing that is in my life because you have beat it on the cross. Amen. So, so here's the charge for us this week and forever. <laughs> um, and it's that first part of the verse that you, you started us off with, Aaron, and it's since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, our Christ, our Lord, mm-hmm. our Savior suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking. Yeah. You have to think like him. Yeah, this flesh is... is Temp, this current fleshly body we live in is temporary. And t- the simplest way to put this is Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Yeah. The cross is the instrument of the death of our flesh. So, let, so let's crawl up on that cross and let's take it with us. Mm-hmm. And let's learn, let's ask the, let's ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, Lord, teach me. Mm-hmm. Teach me how to say no to my flesh when it craves things that are in opposition to you. Um, some of us struggle with pride. And I just wanted to throw that one in there. That's a flesh thing. Mm-hmm. That's pride. That's want, that's the flesh wanting to be elevated and recognized yeah. rather than humbled and God being recognized. Mm-hmm. So we always end in prayer. Uh, Jennifer, why don't you pray for us? Dear Lord, thank you for your word and how it cuts us to the heart. Thank you for teaching us through your word. We pray your word would continue to transform us as we learn it and choose to walk out all that you've commanded us to. We pray we would be people who recognize parts of our hearts that need to change, sin that needs to be repented of, motivations that are not pure, and actions that do not reflect your ways for the purpose of repentance and reconciliation and growth. May your will be done in us and through us. May your light shine brightly through our marriages as we encourage one another to draw closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, we love you guys, and we thank you for joining us this week. Um, please consider leaving us a review and a star rating. You just got to go to the bottom of your podcast app and uh, tap one of those stars and leave a review. We love those, and they help other people find the episodes, find the podcast. Um, and also don't forget to get the free uh, Marriage Prayer Challenge, marriageprayerchallenge.com. See you next week. Did you enjoy today's show? If you did, it would mean the world to us if you could leave us a review on iTunes. Also, if you're interested, you can find many more encouraging stories and resources at marriageaftergod.com and let us help you cultivate an extraordinary marriage.